One application of electrochemical potentials is that we can use them to relate to other aspects of chemistry and figure out other uh, properties that we might want to know. So one thing, one way to do that is by the thermochemical cycle. So we've done this previously in class. Um, where here I'm just going to draw some random example. So if we have a compound going A to B to C, um, if we know that there's a different pathway, A to D to C, what we've said before is that to find the free energy of going from A to C, all we need to know is energies of A and C. So the exact pathway doesn't really matter. So we just need to know the free energies of each step, and we should be able to relate the two. So if we call this, for example, delta G1, and this is delta G2, and this is delta G3, and this is delta G4, by the thermochemical cycle, this pathway, this pathway is equally good as this pathway. And then so if we want to write out our thermochemical uh, equations, what we should be able to do is we could say something like delta G1 going this way followed by delta G2 is going to be equal to going down delta G3 plus delta G4. And I haven't said what reactions these are. These could be reaction reactions, they could be equilibrium reactions, they could be anything. These factors have to hold because uh, their free energies and their state functions. By the same token, if we could do a three-step pathway, for example, if we wanted to do, uh, you know, A going to B, this goes to C, and then, oops, excuse me. Oh. This goes to C, and let's say B goes to C. If we want to find out this energy, so delta G1, 1, delta G2, delta G3. We could say that in this case, delta G1, A going to B. So again, this pathway should be the same as this pathway. But in this case, directionality matters. I said delta G3 was a free energy of going from B to C. So for delta, for, if we're going A to B, delta G1 has got to be equal to going down delta G2 minus delta G3. So I'm just saying this to, for you to keep track of the directions of your arrows and what the respective delta Gs are referring to. Otherwise, you're going to get mixed up between pluses and minuses. OK, so now one uh, question that we could do, let's, say, let's do an example. So if I know that, um, let's say, hexa aqua iron 3. Oops, yes. So hexa aqua iron 3, octahedral. We could add an electron, and then we could reduce this to the hexa aqua iron 2. And then this is in the literature and the standard cell potential, or the standard reduction potential, excuse me. This is a, just a half reaction, right? Not a cell potential. So this is plus 0 0.77 volts versus SHE. And then if we know that the hexacyano uh, iron 3, 3 minus. This can also be reduced by an electron. And then we could then get to ferrocyanide, 4 minus. This has a potential of, in the literature, about positive 0.44 volts. So if we know these respective potentials, what does that tell us about the chemistry? Um, so one question would be, which compound is more stable? So here's my question. Of the hexacyano compounds, which is more stable? So the problem is stability is kind of, it's a weird question to ask. We're talking about stability, we're saying this reduction potential is pretty positive, so it's more favored than possibly reducing protons to hydrogen. But, okay, let, let me specify further. So if we want to think about forming the iron-carbon bond, 
and then we have some sort of equilibrium. So if we are going from the relative hexa-aqua ions, and we have water getting displaced by cyanide, which of, them, which of that equilibria is going to be more stable? So we can, use this, we can figure this question out by doing the thermochemical cycle. So I've kind of drawn this out in this very uh, square scheme type matter, so this is a thermochemical cycle. So we can redraw that up here um, in a way that should express what we want to say. So in a way that's similar to this thermochemical cycle up here. So if we know that 3 plus going to the 2 plus, so this is some sort of electron transfer. And this is going to be some delta G, plus delta G1. And then we can think about the equilibrium constant of binding cyanide and displacing the waters. So let's say we're going down here, and this will be some sort of equilibrium. We're just going to go this way. And then, so then we have our hexocyanide. And then we have the reduction of that. And then we can think about the equilibrium constant here of binding cyanide here. So again, keep in mind, this is, we're talking about cyanide binding for these down arrows. And we're talking about reduction here. Um, so overall, we can find various delta Gs. Let's call this delta G2. This will be delta G3. And this is delta G4. So for the reduction steps, these are you know, half reactions of a reduction. So we should be able to use a standard reduction potentials to figure this out. So this is going to be equal to negative N F E1. This is equal to negative N F E2. And here is a binding equilibrium constant. So if I were to write something like this expression, Something like, uh, yeah, then we'll have our binding of ligands, right? So this has some equilibrium constant. So we know that here, that delta G3, so this would be some equilibrium constant here. We'll call this, let's say, K ox. So this is the equilibrium constant of binding cyanide to the oxidized iron state. So this will be negative RT natural log of K ox. Um, oops, excuse me, this is G2. And by the same token, uh, delta G4 is going to be the RT natural log of K reduced. So now we can relate our thermochemical cycles. So if we have delta G1 and then delta G2, or delta G4, so what we must say is that delta G1 plus delta G4 going this way and this way, it's got to be equal to delta G2 plus delta G3. And so the, the numbers that we actually know are our potentials. So we can get those on both on the same side. So we can have delta G1 minus delta G3 equals delta G2 minus delta G4. And then so we could then say that negative NF E1 minus E3. Oh, I sorry. Excuse me. It's 2. I got the 2s and the 3s all mixed up here. So 2 and 3. And then this is going to be equal to negative RT log. Uh, so G2 is K ox. So this will be K ox over K red. This is a fraction because when you subtract natural logs, they become the natural log of the fraction. And so overall, what we have is that we know that, therefore, E1 is 0.77. E2 
e2 is 0.44. So 0 0.33 volts equals RT over NF natural log of K ox over K red. Oops, that got kind of cut off. Let me write that over here. So 0 0.33 equals negative RT over NF natural log K ox over K red. And then in this case, N equals 1 because we're transferring one electron. And then if we put in standard conditions of 298 uh, degrees Kelvin, then we can cancel things out and do the uh, e to the whatever power. And then the final answer is that we have K ox over K red is going to be around 275,000. So what this means is that, remember, the equilibrium constant is of the binding of cyanide to the oxidized species versus binding of cyanide to the reduced iron 2. Um, and then so we're, we're saying that we're, the oxidized species is more stable by several orders of magnitude. So, uh, iron three plus stronger So because of that, this is how we can relate reduction potentials to actual, or not actual chemistry, but different types of chemistry using thermochemical cycles. Um, we can do the same thing with solubility products, with other types of binding. So we'll go through a few of these examples uh, in actual class.